Hello, hello. I'm Celeste, and this is Week by Week. On today's episode, my husband Dave and I talk all about week 14 of pregnancy, and then later on, our guest is the wonderful Dr. Kristen Eccleston. Let's do this. Week 14, round in the corner. You know what that means. We are officially in the second trimester. Woo! That is a big deal. I Man, I got all these balloons and streamers. It looks great in here. If only. <laughs> but it feels like that. It feels like it's worthy of balloons and streamers because I think there's definitely a holding your breath that happens for the first trimester. And just something for me psychologically happens where I can relax a little bit when I know I've entered the second trimester. So baby's about the size of a peach, and you're either somewhere in the third or fourth month of pregnancy. I've seen both for week 14. I think fourth month of pregnancy is more universally out there. But the reason why they don't count pregnancy in months and they count it in weeks is A, because I think when you do the math, it actually spans more like 10 months of pregnancy. And B, because there are different numbers of weeks and days per month, you can't really go by month. It kind of messes up depending on like what month you got pregnant and all of that. So all right. it gets messy, but but that is why it's a little confusing and convoluted. But I do think that for me, every time I'm like, whew, I'm in the fourth month of pregnancy, it feels like such a step forward in the journey of it that I like it. So that's why I keep it. Yeah. In. Huge marker. Huge marker. Baby's about three and a half inches and weighs about one and a half ounces. So what's going on with baby? Baby's neck is becoming a little more defined and red blood cells are forming in the baby's spleen. Their liver is producing bile and their kidneys are producing urine. So all these systems are really starting to function. Systems. Engage. <laughs> Why is that a little sexy to me? I don't know. <laughs> Hold on. We're going to go do some... Uh... <laughs> <laughs> we're going to do some research. <laughs> some research. Babies at a point in their brain development that enables their facial muscles to move more. So they're now able to squint and grimace and frown. And hopefully smile. Not yet. I did see an article that was like, smiling has not happened yet. <laughs> They are not happy yet. Not happy yet. You got it. They're a tough audience. You yeah, know, you got to win the approval. Sure. Baby's arms are continuing to lengthen and they're getting closer to being more proportionate to their body. And baby's moving around a bunch, but they still might be too small for you to feel it. I want to feel that kid. Come on, kid. Come on, kid. Get bigger. So. Keep kicking. What's happening with you? You might be feeling some relief from morning sickness. And if not this week, then soon. And your energy might be returning. Your bump might be popping and you might be noticing an increase in appetite. That is true for me on both counts. I definitely feel like my bump is popping and I definitely feel so much hungrier just in like one week's time. And I actually, if I'm going to be, I'll, I'll be honest here. I've on the podcast been open about my history with disordered eating. And I had a real check-in with myself this week just to go like, Okay, you're in the second trimester. This is where, if you haven't started gaining weight so far, this is when you start to have substantial changes in your body. And how am I feeling about that? And it was good to have a little check-in. I felt a lot less overwhelmed by it than I did the first time around. I think part of that is from my own personal experience with how the first pregnancy played out, where I had some anxiety about my body changing, and then... Near the end, when my baby was measuring small, not because of anything I was eating, I was eating the whole time, but because of how my placenta was functioning, it really did a kind of recontextualizing for me of some of that idea of hunger and, and fuel and nourishment. And so I feel good about it overall. I feel good. But I, I'm going to keep having this conversation because I think it's really important to be honest about this side and aspect of pregnancy. So, Absolutely. Proud of you. Thank you. This week, you may be feeling round ligament pain. And let's talk a little bit about round ligament pain. Dave, why don't you take it away? All right. Round ligaments are ligaments on either side of your uterus that connect the uterus to the pelvis 
and hold the uterus in place. As your uterus and the ligaments surrounding it grow and stretch, you may feel round ligament pain. They have been described as feeling like cramps, aches, a sharp sensation, a pulling sensation, a nerve spasm, or shooting pain. You may feel it in your abdomen or down into your groin even. Sensation may happen on one or both sides. And according to one article, it can last anywhere from a few seconds to a couple hours. However, a few seconds is more typical. Sudden movements like twisting or changing positions can bring on the feeling, and resting or adjusting positions may help alleviate the sensation. Okay, so fun fact about round ligament pain, if you can say fun fact about it. I've read that though you can experience it on both sides, it's more common on the right side, and doctors don't know why. Hmm. Hmm. Mood swings are still common at this point. Moles on your body might change or appear darker or larger during pregnancy. And this is due to hormonal changes and skin stretching. That said, if you have any questions about a change in a mole, definitely something you want to check out. Talk to your dermatologist. Talk to your dermatologist. So this might be a nice little relief of a symptom. You might notice around this time that you're peeing less than you were in the first trimester. That said, if you are experiencing that relief, it won't last long because by the third trimester, you are peeing constantly. And I think by third trimester, I don't think I could make it through the night without waking up at least twice to pee. So that's on the horizon. But enjoy the relief now if you have it. Smoke them while you got them. <laughs> oh, no, don't do that. Don't no, do sorry, that. Don't do that. Don't do that. That phrase it does not apply. Does not apply. <laughs> And here's a little reminder, your immune system is weaker during pregnancy, and that's because your immune system makes adjustments so you don't reject the baby as it's growing inside you, but that also means that colds and viruses might hit you harder during pregnancy. So just a reminder to wash your hands frequently, take your vitamins, and rest up. How's it going for you, girl? Thank you so much for asking. Hey, girl. We're bringing back Ryan Gosling. <laughs> Hi. So my morning sickness has definitely started to, to get better. It feels like I've really turned a corner. And this was the first week that I didn't feel consistently nauseous, at least at some point throughout the day. If I did feel it, it was like probably more because my blood sugar was going down and less because I was in that morning sickness phase. I've definitely been feeling some cramping, stretching, and growing. And I think I can safely say some round ligament pain. And as I mentioned before, there is definitely a bump there. I read that you tend to pop faster in your second and subsequent pregnancies. That said, regardless of what pregnancy it is for you, where you are, just don't compare your bumps to other people. I will say this from personal experience. It is so easy to get into your head about like, well, they're this week and should I look like this or that? And... It is better just to know that everybody's body responds to pregnancy differently. Your bump journey is your own. So try to relieve yourself of any comparisons if possible. Back to round ligament pain though. This week I had a, such a strange sensation which did fall under the category of round ligament pain. But I was sitting and I twisted and I got what can only be described as feeling like an electric shock through my belly. And it was more on the right side, but I was so kind of shaken by it that I called the doctor just to make sure this was okay because I had never experienced something like this specifically in pregnancy. And the doctor said it sounds like round ligament pain, which is totally normal, but it was such a strange sensation. Like truly it was like a lightning bolt across my stomach. And the doctor I talked to said that round ligament pain generally starts for first-time pregnant people around 16 to 20 weeks, but if you have been pregnant before, it can start as early as 12 to 15 weeks. So it was good to know I was in the, quote, normal range for second pregnancies because I feel like I've been feeling a lot more cramps and things that I didn't feel as early on the first time around. I am craving hot sauce so much. That seems to be my go-to pregnancy craving so far this time around. And I don't know what I'm going to do when the heartburn starts to kick in because that will, it absolutely will. And 
Right now, I feel like I could drink a bottle of hot sauce. <laughs> <laughs> we are scouring websites for hot sauce at this point. They were out of the hot sauce that I normally get. And that was a big problem for me. And so I had yeah. to try some different hot sauces. Wow. It's been a it's been a journey, a hot sauce journey it's been over a here. A hot journey. A hot journey. By almost three years of marriage, that's what a hot journey looks like. <laughs> <laughs> Systems engage. <laughs> See, it works for me. It's still working. <laughs> So this last update was a really exciting one for me, and that is, I think I felt my first flutter. Super early, was not expecting to feel anything at this point, but very exciting if that's what it was, and excited to feel more. I'll get into all the specifics around the first flutter and first movements in a week or two, but for now, I think I felt it. So cool. So cool. Here is what I Googled this week. When do you first feel the baby move? <laughs> it can happen as early as week 13 to 16, especially for people who have been pregnant before. But in general, it looks like week 17 to 22 is a pretty average range for feeling movement for the first time. And this has been the week 14 update. This has been the week 14 update brought to you by week by week. Brought to you by Celeste. Brought to you by Wheaties. <laughs> Our guest today is Dr. Kristen Eccleston. I got so much out of this conversation. She's a researcher, advocate, and educator with a focus on examining and supporting adolescent mental health in an education environment. She's also very well versed in the needs of neurodiverse brains and is finding all sorts of ways to support the mental health needs of students. She's a doctor of education and a master's of science, both from Johns Hopkins, as well as a ton of other credentials. and. It was so great to speak to someone so knowledgeable, so passionate about making a change. And like I said before, finding ways to truly support students and children in mental health and education. I loved this conversation and I can't wait to share it with you. So let's do this. Well, thank you so much for joining me today. No, thanks for having me. I'm really excited to be talking with you. I'm so excited for this conversation. To start off, do you mind telling me a little bit about the work you do? Sure, sure. So my name is Dr. Kristen Eccleston, and the work that I do is a lot of different things. I wear a lot of different hats, but my main thing is I am a family education consultant. So I work with a lot of families who are having difficulty with navigating the special education process. Mm -hmm. And my main niche or what I like to focus on specifically is mental health and education. And this can mean so many different things. It can mean having students who are having trouble with just mental health, there's schizophrenia, bipolar, anxiety, depression, or sometimes it's behaviorally based, but usually there's always kind of a root cause to what's going on. I tend to find myself working a lot with students who are neurodiverse as well. I think that is tends to lend itself that school is a one-size-fits-all box. And when mm. you have a lot of messages that make you feel like something is wrong with you for not fitting in that one-size-fits-all box, it then brings in that mental health aspect. So I kind of wear a lot of a lot of hats, but that's kind of my niche area that I like to stick with. It's students who are really having either externally based or really my focus is those internalizing based students who are having difficulties. And that's students anywhere from kindergarten all the way through high school. I've even helped some students at the college level. And then I also support some education tech companies as well in their professional development of trying to help teachers understand what mental health looks like and what that is in the classroom and how they can best support students. That's so fantastic. I wanted to start with one quick definition going back to what you were saying. Sure. We're hearing this word more and more, and I think it's great. And I recently found out that I fall into this category, but do you mind defining what neurodivergent means? Absolutely. And neurodiverse or neurodivergent means a lot of different things, but Typically, when you think of neurodiverse, you think of people who have autism, who have ADHD, who might be dyslexic, dyscalculia, who Tourette's falls into that sensory processing disorder. And when I'm thinking of it in my mind, I'm almost thinking of Venn diagrams and each one of these categories kind of overlap each other a little bit. So a lot of the same 
I hate to word, use the word symptoms, but a lot of the mm -hmm. same symptoms or the way it presents can be very similar. Things that are very common in autism can also be common in ADHD and sensory processing disorder. And sometimes you can have ADHD and sensory processing disorder, but it usually has, I like to think of it as you see the world differently. You view things differently. You are a creative thinker. You can be very analytical in how you might process things, but you might have some some things that might hold you back a little bit too. Maybe time management is not your thing. Maybe executive functioning impacts you a little bit. But being neurodiverse to me is just you have a different and unique way of seeing the world. And as you said, unfortunately, classrooms tend to be set up to fit an umbrella, one size fits. I think you said one size fits most, which I love. Will you tell me a little bit about ways that you come in and help support students who maybe don't fall under that umbrella of, quote, most? Absolutely. So some of the ways that I support students is trying to also help schools understand how they can best support students. And it mm. looks so different. There really isn't one example for me to give you because some students get to a point where they become completely school avoidant. School has just become anxiety inducing, it has mm. become overwhelming. Maybe it's that sensory processing piece where having to navigate the hallways of thousands of people is just way too much. Mm -hmm. And it becomes a setting factor and it needs to be a smaller setting, maybe where smaller class sizes, teachers who can give more one-on-one -on -one support. It could also be students who are incredibly bright. I mean, like cure cancer type of bright and just school has become very boring to them because mm -hmm. they're above and beyond what, what their neurotypical peers are able to access or understand, or maybe they just see things differently. It could also be that sometimes being neurodiverse, you need those movement breaks. You need to be able to get up. You need to move. You need to be able to hyper-focus and then take a break. And, and school's just not structured that way. So there are so many different things. So what I really try to do is look at the child as an individual and what do they specifically need to be successful in school and then help schools. I also help schools with some students who have been hospitalized for periods of time and now they're transitioning back from the hospital back into the school setting and really trying to help the school understand what that looks like. Because one of the worst things that has always been done, and I actually think has been done to a lot of students post-pandemic too, is we went back from that zero to 100, let's just go back mm -hmm. to normal. And kids just don't function that way. You have to have a little bit of a buildup. So I do work with schools that way as well and, and helping them understand what that should look like. It should maybe we should start with half days. Maybe the expectations of work should be limited to, you know, just making sure they're sitting there listening or engaged, but not expecting them to do the full assignment yet. So, again, very tailored to the individual child and, and trying to help the schools understand that that child needs to be in the driver's seat of mm -hmm. what they're ready for. Because I think oftentimes as adults, we often say this is what this kid needs or this is what we're going to do. And we forget to include children in asking mm. them, what do you need? Or what are you feeling? Or, or what would make school more manageable for you? Or what would make you feel better about school? So I like to make sure that students have a voice in that, even if they're really young, because their buy-in to me makes a huge difference and then what they're able to accomplish when they're back in the school setting. As a parent and as an adult, we link control to safety. And so if we have the answers, we go, okay, well, we'll figure it out and we'll figure out the best plan and we can see around all these corners and it gives us some sense that we're doing something. Mm -hmm. And so I love that idea of actually involving the child and having conversations and remembering like, this is a human being with thoughts and feelings and opinions and we can include them in the conversation. I think that's great. Oh, absolutely. And I think a lot of times with, with children, especially children who are dealing with anxiety, a lot of that is from that lack of feeling and control, especially if you have students who then or children who then have that OCD component too. OCD really is that way of trying to make control when there isn't that feeling of control. And so I think when you can kind of circle them back into the decision-making process, even if they get just the sense of feeling like, okay, my feelings are being accounted for, I have a voice, that can make a huge difference for a child rather mm -hmm. than just continuing to feel like they're not in control and people are just making choices for them. I mean, ultimately adults need to do what's best for their child. Right. But I think allowing the child to have a voice at least soothes some of that level of anxiety that they might be experiencing. That's great. And on that note, do you have tips or tools for parents or educators to start engaging in mental health conversations with kids? 
the first thing to really think about when you're dealing with mental health conversations with students is really just starting to teach them about feelings and identifying feelings. Anger is one of the easiest emotions. Think about it. Anytime you've ever stubbed your toe or, you know, you stood up too fast and you hit your head, right? What is, what is your immediate emotion that you go to? Usually you're angry right mm -hmm. off the bat, right? And that's the same thing for little kids. And they don't have the capacity to kind of think through that. So I think starting to help children, especially young children, identify emotions and understand where they're coming from and also letting them know that even as adults, we all have emotions because I think that's the mm -hmm. other thing too. I think as adults, we try to hold it together and make it look like we, we've got all the answers and we know everything. So I think there's something good about being a little bit vulnerable to children mm -hmm. and letting them show that you're also a human and you sometimes experience big emotions. That's a positive thing for them too. But helping them, I think back to those posters, I don't know if you've ever seen it. And it, I, it's this little boy with like spiky hair or something, but he's got all these different faces, like an angry face, a sad face. Oh, yeah. And I think stuff like that is great because you're helping children to identify their emotions. There's also a thing called zone of regulation, which is like green, red, red, yellow, and then like where you are in your feelings chart, stuff like that is fantastic for children. And that helps them understand like I'm in the red, I'm in the yellow, I'm green, I'm, I'm really, I'm good, I'm, I'm ready to go. So helping with that breathing is a big thing to help children with. Self-regulation is usually the biggest thing for our, our littlest guys. They don't have that self-regulation. So self-regulation is a big thing. And how you can accomplish that, this is for parents and for teachers, is through something called co-regulation. So mm -hmm. essentially what that means is you are modeling what you want to be able to have that child do. So if they're escalated and they're upset and they're having a really hard time with that self-regulation piece, instead of you also getting flustered, the best thing you can do is take a deep breath, talk to them very calmly, say, I understand you have a lot of big emotions right now, that validation of their feelings, but we're going to work through this together. And you don't ever get yourself escalated and you don't mm. raise your voice. You stay up because what you're doing is you're modeling to them what you want them to be able to do. And that will help in their self-regulation when you're maybe not right there or readily available or if they're at school. So those are all things teachers, things that parents can do when helping their children with that self-regulation piece, especially when they're young and even when they're in high school, still continuing to do that. I mean, that hormonal shift around puberty, oh middle school into high school, right? You get all those big emotions all mm -hmm. over again. So the best thing you can do as a parent then is that same thing, that co-regulation and showing them like, I understand validating those feelings. I, you know, I would have felt that same way when I was your age. That that would have made me very angry too. But like, let's take a deep breath. Let's count to five. Let's let's talk through it. And you staying calm helps them. And it also helps with that anxiety piece too. Because mm -hmm. if you as the adult are not getting yourself elevated or escalated or frustrated, then it helps them have that sense of security and peace as well. Knowing that you as the support adult isn't getting worked up, then they go, okay, then maybe I can manage this. Maybe, maybe I can handle this. But because we're all vulnerable to that, right? How many times yeah. have we got into a, an argument with our parent or gotten frustrated and we get, you know, they get escalated too because we're yelling and they don't want to put up with it. But right. honestly, the best thing you can do is the kind of modeling back the behavior to the child that you want to see from them when they're trying to process the emotion. That's so fantastic. And it it's good work, I think, to be doing as a human being. You know, it's such a reminder for you as you were saying, like, it is easy to end up kind of being pulled by the momentum of somebody mm -hmm. else's emotion. So as a parent or an, I guess an educator, it's maybe a less appropriate place to have a reaction like this. But as a parent, do you have any thoughts on ways to kind of stay in yourself? Or is that kind of going back to those mindfulness techniques that you were talking about of breathing and grounding? You know, I use some of the techniques that I used as an educator, too, because I think it's important to note that even as a teacher, sometimes if you have a kid who's berating you or yelling, depending on the type of population of student you might be working with, you're a human being, too. You yeah. have feelings. Having a child yell at you is hard. But I, I was taught this, this acronym many, many years ago. It's called Q-TIP, and it's Quit Taking It Personal. And that's one of the biggest things that stick in my mind, especially with if I'm teaching and I'm working with students or even with my own children, 
I'm not taking it personal. Again, they're learning how to regulate their emotions as little people, right? And they're mm -hmm. looking to me as how to learn that. And you know, a lot of how we learn how to parent is how people parented us, what we've been exposed to. So I try to remember that Q-tip, working with students, working with my own children, quit taking it personal. There are big feelings that are happening and that's why I validate the feelings. I understand how you're feeling. I would be upset or angry too if I was dealing with this. But then I'm taking whatever they're throwing at me, not in a personal space, especially mm -hmm. as a parent. A lot of times our children use us as their safe space. I don't know if you've ever heard stories of somebody's like, but my child doesn't do that at school. And then they come yeah. home and it's just like they're a disaster and they take it and they start yelling at me. And I talk to the teachers and they're like, they're a perfect angel. Why is this happening? And it's because a lot of times you as the parent is that safe space, that unconditional love. And so the, the child might hold it together and then melt down on you. So knowing it's not a personal thing, if anything, you represent safety and security. And so mm -hmm. don't take it personal. Breathe through it, model what you want your child to see, how you're reacting to it. Because if you're escalating, then it's showing them that they can escalate. So it's not a personal attack. We're helping them work through the big feelings. We're helping them identify the big feelings. We're giving them the breathing. And I recognize that's not an easy thing. It's something mm -hmm. that as an adult, you have to be mindful of, you have to work on. And But I think once you are kind of aware of it and you can kind of put these tools in your mind, it makes it a little bit easier, especially yeah. if you know you're not alone. Because I think that's the other thing too as parents. Most everybody is dealing with some child who's overtired, has had a bad day. And you too as an adult have probably overtired, could mm -hmm. have had a bad day. So by no means am I saying, oh, it's so easy, just, just do it and your life will be grand. But I think it will help you in the long run and it'll help your child in the long run with that self-regulation piece. Those are great tools. And the other thing that comes into mind, because I love what you're saying about, you know, validating and saying you understand. And I think another knee-jerk reaction, if we don't get really, you know, emotional or drawn into maybe the momentum of the emotion is that we want to fix immediately. And this is partners, this is kids, this is, you know, I think any human relationship, it's uncomfortable for us to see our loved ones uncomfortable. Yes. And so it's hard. Do you have thoughts on kind of staying in that zone? Or maybe it's exactly what you outlined of just kind of validating and giving the space for it. But I'm so, I think the importance of giving space is just like a premium. And so I'm always interested in tools and perspectives on continuing to create that space. I actually have... Um... An interesting perspective on this. I read a really great book and I, I want to say, I always blink on it and I should, I quote it all the time. So I should really get it down to a science here, but <laughs> I want to say it's called a nation of wimps. And it's actually a really interesting perspective because I think you're probably aware we've had a lot of increase in suicide, suicide ideations in our youth over the, the last you know 10 years. And one of the things that I wanted to understand was why was this happening? And this mm -hmm. book really started to point out this idea of resiliency. And this is what triggered this thought when you said that is, you're right, as a parent, when we see our child hurting, we want to stop that hurt. It hurts us almost to have to see mm -hmm. our child hurting in any ways. And this book really gave a really interesting perspective. It was written by a child psychologist, and it was this idea of, we've got to allow our children to face some levels of discomfort, right? Mm -hmm. We have to allow them to, you know, not be the winner all the time. We need to allow them to not get the first place trophy or for them to have had altercations with peers. Now, that doesn't mean we stand back in the corner and we don't interject. But again, talking about the validation, talking through feelings is, I think, the best way to help them move through it. Mm -hmm. But if we just make it so they never have to feel any kind of discomfort, we shield them or protect them from it, eventually they grow up to be adults. And then that's where that real problem kicks in. And this talked about these children who were going off to college and things some simple as, you know, a breakup. We all have a breakup at some point in college, mm -hmm. right? It feels like the end of the world when it's <laughs> happening, right? But, you know, we're sad. We move on. You know, life happens. But these kids were having it where they would they would literally harm themselves or even mm -hmm. commit suicide over it because they had never had to feel that disappointment or that hurt before. And so something at, like a breakup was the complete end of the world. Or they would go off and they had been the number one track star for forever. Now they go to college and now they're a little fish in this big pond instead of the big fish in this little pond. 
and, and they really couldn't deal with that because they had never had to been second best before in their life mm -hmm. or they had never lost before. So they had no sense of perseverance and they had no sense of resiliency because they had been sheltered from it their entire lives. And I think it's, I know, in fact, I know it's hard because I, as a parent, have seen my children hurt over interactions with peers or things that happen. And it hurts. I mean, it hurts you. You want to make it stop, not just for your child, but I think for your own, your own sake as well. But to some degree, you have to let your children have those feelings and experience mm -hmm. those emotions so that when they become adults, they can persevere. So that little things like a breakup don't become the end of the world for them. So to me, that's, again, validating. I understand how this feels. It would stink. I've had this happen. You know, share stories from when you were younger. And, and so they mm -hmm. know that they're not alone and that other people feel these things as well, too. But let them feel the feelings to a degree so that they don't get to a point in their adulthood where they can't deal with the feelings. Yeah, yeah that's so interesting. And I, I think as by allowing them to feel it, I'd also think like you're showing them that no emotion is so scary that you can't move through it. Or, you know, mm -hmm. if something gets so oppressively, I can't move through it, then there are other tools, like maybe we need to intervene in, you know, therapy, medication, other types of ways. But I think it at least opens the door for resiliency and for looking if something actually does arise that needs another type of attention. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you're, you hit that spot on, like if at any point the signs are bigger and, and you know, therapy, medication, I'm, I'm a wholeheartedly component of it. Go, go to the doctor, have the doctor evaluate. But I think it's just the idea of not making it so that your child ever has to hurt or ever has to feel it. Yes. That is a detriment yeah. to your child. Yes. Yeah, it's like the trophy culture where everybody's a winner and nobody yes. ever feels the difference. And it also, you know, I think in thinking about like neurodiversity, like we were talking about at the top or talking about this now, it also takes away the the beauty of differences. The fact mm -hmm. that we don't always all have to be the same in order to be like equal, I guess. Yes. You know, we can be equal in the ways that matter, like inequality in the sense of equality without no you know, I know taking I know away. exactly what you're saying what I like to say is equality doesn't mean equal mm, I love that and then that's because everybody has different needs and different levels of needs right yeah. and there's a great picture in my mind it's like think of a fence and everybody is a different height so somebody needs a box to stand on that's this big but then the next kid only needs a box to stand on that this big in order to see over the fence. So not everybody has the exact same size box to stand on to be able to see over the fence. Everybody has something different, but in the end, they're all on that same playing field. They can all see over the fence. And that's kind of how I see it in my mind. And we have to be open to equal doesn't mean equality. Equality has some differentiation. As long as at the end of the day, we're all on the same playing field. That's what we're trying to get to. I love that image. And it, something that that brought to mind for me was do you have techniques or thoughts, I guess, in general about navigating maybe a family that has, you know, a kid with maybe some mental health needs and then a kid who doesn't and finding a way to navigate the differences inside of a single household? Absolutely. In fact, I've worked with families who have this exact dynamic, and I'm going to give this family, I obviously won't call them out, but I'll give them credit for some of what they were doing is they recognized that their child with mental health needs was taking a lot of their, their time, their energy, their emotion, and they were very cognizant of the fact that they wanted to make sure their child who was more neurotypical and, and didn't have the same level of needs, didn't feel like they were getting the short end of the stick. And mm -hmm. and one of the things that they did is they, they knew that their one child with the mental health needs needed to be in a private school setting that needed to look a certain way. And so they started looking for opportunities and programming for their child who didn't have these needs so that they could also feel like they had something that was special to them. Now, I think there had even been an opportunity for that child to go to the same school as the other child, which would have made mm -hmm their life easier, right? But they mm -hmm. recognize that they're like, but this child doesn't need some of those same supports. That child would get probably frustrated and resent their sibling for having to be in a school setting that, that was making them do things that they didn't really need. So they looked for settings that were more appropriate to what their strengths were, what their interests mm -hmm. were. I think they were very interested in art. So they were making it very an art-based type of setting. And, and not everybody obviously has the means to put everybody in different private schools. But I mm -hmm. think the ultimate message there is just 
making sure that if you have a child who maybe isn't as demanding of your time, that you're still recognizing their strengths and mm. still recognizing the things that they're really good at and finding a special space or opportunity for them so that they feel like they still have some of your time and your energy. Because I think that was the biggest thing that stood out in my mind is the parents were very cognizant that they didn't want that one sibling to eventually resent the other sibling. Yeah. And so they knew that they had to give a lot of time and energy to that sibling with the mental health needs, but they wanted to make sure that that other sibling continued to care for their sister and still had opportunities for them to feel special. And and I don't think it takes a private school, but it just opportunities to help them feel special. That could be as simple as doing an outing that was just them or making sure if there's an interest or a concert or an art that you take them to a museum or a mm. concert or something that's special to them. So it's just making sure that they're not getting left behind because the other mm. child has so many more needs that are more demanding of time. That's really helpful. Going back to your work with schools for a minute, you worked in schools and then you started doing programming to kind of enhance what the schools could do when it came to support. Mm -hmm. Was there anything that became super obvious to you in that either side of the equation that this is a big gap in how we're helping students with mental health needs or neurodiversity? I feel like a lot of things that are being done mental health wise are being done as a let's check the box. Let's check mm -hmm. the box to say that we're, you know, we're in tune with mental health because it's a hot and coming topic or it's being done very surface level. There's different tiers of support. So a tier one is your basic, like, let's do social emotional learning, which is great. And, and mm -hmm. I want to make sure that I'm very clear that I think having social emotional learning in schools is phenomenal. It's much needed. I think it helps with that self-regulation piece that I talked about earlier. And ultimately what social emotional learning is doing is taking students who are kind of here and helping them stay here. Mm -hmm. It's helping them realize that, okay, if I get escalated, okay, I, I have the skills to get myself back here and stay regulated. But to me, the biggest gaps that currently exist are your kids who are beyond that tier one. There's nothing. There's, I mean, there's literally nothing. And I mean, look mm. nationwide, not even just locally, what is out there is so limited. It's just so limited. And that to me is the biggest piece that's, that's missing is there are students who are hurting and especially what I call internalizing students. And these are the students who all the emotions kind of go inward. You have externalizing students who I'm going to call the squeaky wheel, right? They still need love. They need support. They need programming and they need help. But a lot more exists for them because they make their needs known, right? They're the ones who are angry, who who throw papers, who flip desks, who, who curse teachers out, whatever it might look like, right? Mm -hmm. They're that squeaky wheel so you know something is going on. But then you have the polar opposite. You have these internalizing students who maybe they're A plus students, but they're operating at a C level right now. And it's mm -hmm. not raising anybody's red flag because they're passing their classes. So yeah, they're capable of more, but they're not doing it right now because other things are going on. Maybe they're the ones who skip, not, I don't wanna say skip school, are not going to school as frequently as they should because there's that avoidance piece or that anxiety piece. They're the ones when it's time to get into groups or work with peers, they'd rather work by themselves or stay mm -hmm. quiet or isolated. Or they're the ones who at lunchtime, they don't wanna go into the cafeteria or if they do, they're sitting alone at a table. And people go, oh, they're just, you know, they're not really connecting with their peers, but they're not recognizing the deeper level of mental health needs that's going on within that child. And eventually to me, that starts at a young age and it just tends to build and it builds and it builds until eventually, I would say late middle school, early high school, that's when they hit this wall and that's when hospitalizations occur mm -hmm. or self-harm starts or suicidal ideations start. And people, oh, well, where did this come from? How did this happen? And, and it's, the signs had really been there all along, but they weren't, hitting you in the face like a child who really makes it known, that externalizing child. And so there's a lot of gaps, in my opinion, for those internalizing students. Those are who I worry about. Those mm -hmm. are the ones who I fear are not getting the attention and are not getting the supports. And the system really hasn't set themselves up to support or identify. And, and there's so many different reasons. Some of it is teachers just don't know. 
what mental health looks like. And this is not a beat up on teachers. You know, they don't teach teachers in teacher college or when you're going through the university system about mental health or what it looks like. So a lot of that is stigma or personal bias or what the mm -hmm. media tells you. And then there's a disconnect. Is that my job? Should I be interjecting? Should I not be interjecting? Am I here to teach? Yeah. Am I here to be a social worker? So there's so many different components to that. But bottom line is the kids get missed. And the what was a small issue that could have been fixed early on becomes a much bigger issue. And then by the time it becomes a much bigger issue, the supports and resources just aren't there. And People just don't know what to do to support those students when it gets to that point. Yeah. And I was very fortunate in my career that I worked with really amazing individuals that I had the opportunity to build a program specifically for those types of students. But that's one place in one county, in one state, in our entire country. Yeah. And, and this to me is something that is needed everywhere, everywhere, because these students are getting overlooked. And these are things that can get turned around. I had students who were hospitalized for an entire year of high school who by the time they came back to school, when they graduated senior year, they were taking AP classes and went on to college and, and are, being, are doing very well and are being very successful. So the opportunities are there if we have the right programming and supports put in place for students. If you could just wave a magic wand and funding magically came into place, what are some of the kind of building blocks of a program that would be helpful to serve those students? I'm going to kind of model what we had because, I, like I said, I was very fortunate to work with amazing people. I had a full-time social worker, so that was a big piece right there. We were in a general high school, so think of your neighborhood high school, but we had our mm -hmm. own little small little section, so we were almost like a school within a school. So the students still had access if you wanted to be on the sports team when you were ready for that a lot of our students early on were not ready for that, but once they were, it was there. But there was only three to 15 students maximum in any class. Mm -hmm. Each one of the teachers was a special education teacher so they who was also a case manager. So you had like an academic support or advisor who was there, who was built in. Then you had paraeducators who were like support teachers who were there. I had a behavior management person who was there. We had a classroom that was just dedicated. We call it the Zen resource room. So that was like, if you needed to have a break, mm -hmm. uh, you could go in there and work. There was somebody in there to process with you. If you ended up needing more time, I think we allotted like 20 minutes in there for students. Then you would go to see our social worker so you could continue the processing. If students ended up needing to be hospitalized, I had somebody who was right there as my social worker who could make that decision and we could make that happen on the spot. We only had 40 students, I believe at the time. Actually, we got up to 58 at one point in time, but we were only supposed wow. to have 40 students. <laughs> There's now been another location open, opened up because of that factor, but it That's was amazing. small and you could support students like that. And then we individualized it to students we would go out to their home once they were placed with us. If we couldn't get them to school, if school avoidance had really become something really big, myself and my social worker, we'd go out to the house, we'd establish relationships that way. If you had to just touch the front door, we worked with you on just touching the front door. And then when that felt good, let's walk through the front door. And then I had some kids who didn't go to school for a year, and then the second they got placed in this program, they came every single day because it was just wow. a setting piece. It was just setting. Yeah. Like once it yeah. wasn't overwhelming and that could have been that sensory processing need, it wasn't overwhelming and they could come into the school setting. It worked fantastic for them. That's and beautiful. people would ask me all the time, what's your, what's the secret? There was no secret. It literally was just taking into account what individually each child needed yes. and making it happen for them. And I had a dedicated staff who, who understood the mission, who understood the assignment and were dedicated to helping make that happen for students. Given some of the current events going on right now, have you noticed a change in students' mental health in regards to maybe added school security or the things that are just going on that are so horrifying and what are ways that parents can help have some of these conversations with kids? Absolutely. So I'm going to do it in a couple stages here. So the first was post-pandemic. Absolutely, there was a rise in mental health, and it didn't matter the age, kindergarten through through high school. And even for the first time, I started to see individuals like third graders who were mm -hmm. being hospitalized for suicidal ideations. And that just 
I couldn't believe third graders with the suicidal yeah. ideation. And it just showed me that the pandemic, and I think everybody, I mean, honestly, everybody, adults, it doesn't matter. Like, I think we've all had this shift in mental health culturally that's happened, but students have really felt that. And I think a lot of that was that zero to 100 that I mentioned earlier, right? We just expected students to come back into the classroom after a year at home, like mm -hmm. nothing had happened. There may be like we all wore masks for a while, or maybe we, you know, we, there were some things in place, but you know, you didn't have the flexibility if you had a snack, if you wanted a snack, you didn't have flexible seating anymore. It's just like business as usual. And, and kids just don't, they just don't process that way. So I felt like that has, has had repercussions. And I think they, it will have repercussions for some time, just as far as mental health goes. And then you're right, you add in other factors, like the things that have happened in Texas recently, and it, that seems to be an ongoing. And there's a couple things that play there. I think one, I get really scared and nervous about children and how this desensitizes them to such crazy things like mm -hmm. like that. And, you mm -hmm. know, the more something happens, the more you're exposed to something, you become desensitized to it. And at mm -hmm. no point in time should we ever culturally get to a point where that's just normal. It's just like, oh, another another day just happened again. Like that terrifies me because that that shouldn't be normal. And then I think it does create another level of anxiety for students because now you're in a setting that you have to go to by law, you have to go there. And some children are really sensitive to, to this idea about, you know, am I going to an environment where I'm not going to be safe, especially because some students see school as a safe place because they don't have great home lives or they, right. they don't have great settings and, and school's supposed to be that safe space for them. So that plays a lot of dynamics. And I was recently asked about what we should be saying or not be saying to students. And my thought was, I don't know that we should be talking about details to students. Now, I will let me back up for a second and say, I think every parent has to know their child best. Mm. And this is mm -hmm. something I truly believe. What you might share with one child who is the same age might not be what you would share with another child who is the same age. Mm -hmm. You as a parent have to know your child. You have to know their maturity level. You have to know what they can process versus what they can't process. And I wouldn't inflict adult things on your child who is not psychologically ready or mature enough for it. If it's just going to create more worries and more anxieties in your child, then I wouldn't share everything. But if your child is very socially, emotionally mature and it actually would help them process through things by sharing more with them, then do it. But just as a parent, make that decision based on who your child is and not what you feel like you just want to share with your child. that mm -hmm. That's the one thing that I will kind of say as a precursor to what I'm about to say. Mm -hmm. But with, with that said, my feeling is I wouldn't share the details of everything with your child. I wouldn't say that this is how many people were hurt or killed, or this is what it looked like, or this is how they were scared. I would say somebody did a bad thing. You know, bad things happen. There are bad people in this world and we have to be prepared when that happens. And, and keep it more of that type of conversation. Yeah. Don't get into the details or the nitty gritty of it that I feel like would just spark more anxiety in your child, but more of just sharing the concept of, unfortunately, there are bad people out there, but there's good people out there. And mm. this is what the good people are doing to try and prevent these things from happening in the future and really try to make that your focus. So mm -hmm. you're not covering up or hiding the fact that something bad has happened, but you're also sharing that we are working to do something better. We are working to try and make it so that doesn't happen anymore. This is what these people in our society are doing. And I mean, maybe even do a little research on your end, look at what your constituents are doing, or mm -hmm. look at what, you know, government is doing, or the police are doing, and like, just look things up so that you can provide those type of details to your children of, Here's what good people are doing to try and make this a better situation so that children in the future don't have to experience this bad thing. And then talk about mental health. Talk about being a good friend. Talk about, you know, people who sometimes do bad things or people who are also hurting. And that's why it's it's best to be kind to everybody. And if you see somebody who's lonely, to reach out and be that kind person in their mm -hmm. life. I think that's an important conversation too, is teaching your children about kindness and reaching out. Or if they see things that don't seem right of speaking up, because I think that's an important factor too. I yeah. When I heard about what happened in Texas, the first thing I needed to do 
for my own sake was I needed to know everything about that kid. I needed to know what his life looked like. Mm -hmm. I needed to know what kind of experiences he had had because that's how I could wrap my mind around something that was so horrendous. And I didn't and couldn't ever excuse the actions that he made. But knowing that he was a child who had parents who had substance abuse issues, had been, you know, was in his mom's house, but now he had to live with his grandparents who had been bullied, who had never graduated from high school, who had never had any real peer connections. That was like red flag, red flag, red flag, like just Mm -hmm. red flag after red flag of Mm -hmm. who knows if that could have changed the outcome. But I'd like Mm -hmm. to think that if somebody had picked up on those red flags, maybe, just maybe, that could have saved a lot of hurt and a lot of pain in people's mm-hmm. lives. Yeah, that makes that makes a lot of sense. And going back for one second to talking to your kids, I would assume that you would want to also make space for them to talk about whatever emotions came up, just like you had talked about early on. Absolutely. And then also open the door for if you do have questions, you know, please come to me. Because I think the thing that I have a very young child right now, so we're not at a place where we're having these type of conversations yet. But something that I think about is like, I want him to be able to hear these things from me. But I also want to, as you said, meet his needs where he is mentally, emotionally, and what he can hold at that time. Mm-hmm. So I'm I'm just very, I'm very curious about continuing to try to navigate these really tricky, almost impossible, it feels like, but essential conversations that we have to have right now. No, and you're absolutely right. Do open that door to ask them how they're feeling and what what emotions have been brought up. And that way that, you know, I am scared or I am not feeling safe at school, but that way there you're validating goes back to that validating the emotions piece. I think that's incredibly important to do. And I think it's important to understand, like, you're right. Like, your young child, you may not bring this up to them because it's not something that's um, psychologically appropriate for them Mm -hmm. versus a child who maybe is school-aged and now as a result, they're having to do school shooter drills or they're having to do things. And so this is going to come up and it's going to be at the forefront of their mind because of what they're being exposed to at school. So again, it's kind of knowing your child, knowing the age of your child and and what's appropriate to bring up. I obviously, I don't think, you know, having this conversation with your three-year-old is necessarily right. Something that should be brought up or something that needs to take away from their childhood either. I think that's that's one of the things that make me the most sad is having these young children almost get robbed of childhood mm-hmm. in, in a little bit because they're having to be exposed to these complex scenarios and situations that they're really, they shouldn't have to be exposed to yet in their life. Yeah, it feels like almost an impossible thing to balance because the fact that, as you said, earlier that this is happening so frequently and it's almost becoming a place where you can see it getting normalized in people's minds and it leads to inaction and it leads to numbness and so there are systemic changes that have to happen obviously and ways to figure out how we can prevent this from ever happening again but then there's also just those reality of those conversations and it's heartbreaking to think to have to talk about this with any child, but then there's a reality of it. So it's, yeah, I I mean, I don't know if I have a point there beyond it's just, it feels like we're put in a really tough position and heartbreaking position. I think we are. And, and I'd love to say this is the, this is the magic answer, but I don't know if there is a magic answer. And this is really the first time in our history that we've really had to think, okay, how are we handling this? How are we moving forward? What are we doing to protect children. And I I read something or I listened to something recently that was that I was like, oh my gosh, I'd never that thought hadn't crossed my mind before is that most children now who, if you were to decide to make a poor decision and do something at a school, are all children now who have been exposed to school shooting drills at mm-hmm. some point in their life. So they're cognizantly aware of the actions and what's supposed to be done. And that is another terrifying concept and idea that to me just adds one more layer of complexity to this to this whole thing and so yeah uh, we definitely have to have solutions and ideas and ways moving forward because this isn't something that can continue to happen for the sake and the safety not just for the sake and safety but for mentally for our children too not something they should have to to fear and and continually have happen 
to them. Yes. Yes. Well said. Well said. Is there a question that you wish more people asked you? I'm putting you on the spot a little bit. I, you know, and I think you you asked me the question actually, and it was if I had the mag- if there was a magic wand mm-hmm. and if all the funding was in place, that question that would be the question because I actually think that we could do a lot more, and and it's not as complex as people would think it is. In fact, I'll I'll give you a statistic for that program because of the way the laws are set up, public schools are required to offer a free and appropriate public education. That's a law. It's called FAPE, free and appropriate public education. And if they can't meet a child's needs, if a child has an IEP and they and they cannot meet that child's needs, by law, they have to then fund a placement. So a private placement, usually what it ends up being, they have to fund it in order to provide that free and appropriate public education. Well, a lot of students who have these significant mental health needs end up falling into that category, and then there's funding that has to go along with it. And like I said, there's not a lot out there. There's just, there's not a lot out there. And I did the math one day with administrator that I worked with, and we were able to determine that we were saving upwards of $4 million a year, a year in private placements for the students by keeping them within the public setting and, and having this type of program. Now, granted, you would lose some of that $4 million in teacher salary and different things, but not all of that $4 million. You would still have several million dollars left in in the pot after paying all of your teachers. And so things like that, to me, I wish people would realize that there was a way to get children quality education while getting them the supports that they need Mm -hmm. and ultimately would be financially responsible of the school districts and the school county. And And I am like, I'm the first one in line to be like, please let me help you do it. Please, please, (laughs) please let me help you do it. We can do it. We can make it great. We can help students. You can save money in the meantime. So I think that's what I wish people would ask me more because I'm so strongly committed to having these students have the education and the supports that they need to be successful. And there's ways to do it. I don't feel like it's as complex as people think it it, it, it mm-hmm. would be. It's not. It really isn't. That's so fantastic. And it's honestly really relieving to hear that there are people smarter than me who have plans <laughs> that if we are able to direct funding toward them could make a huge difference. Okay, so... If a child is showing signs that they might need some mental health help or support, that is a tongue twister. What is a first step a parent can take? Because I think that can sometimes feel like the biggest hurdle or feel very overwhelming just to know where to begin. You know, that's a great question. So, and I'll even give a story and I'll put I'll put my daughter out there a little bit, but I think sometimes it helps with stories. During the pandemic, my mother, unfortunately, had been diagnosed with throat cancer. Mm-hmm. And so, and she's doing great. She's, she's here with me on vacation right now. So things are good there. But for a while, she was, she was in a bad place. And so we had the heightened pandemic and all the issues associated with that. So we had to be a little bit more intense on like our hand sanitizing mm-hmm. and stuff because I was a primary caretaker for her. And I think unknowingly, I took that stress and put it on my daughter. And my daughter got to a point where she was afraid of touching a certain stuffed animals because she was afraid certain stuffed animals would get COVID mm-hmm. if she touched a certain stuffed animal. And she was almost getting like OCD tendencies of like washing her hands to the point where we had to get a cream from the doctor because her hand had gotten so mm-hmm. raw. And I was just beating myself up because it wasn't something that I was trying to make her paranoid about. It was more that like I just had to be really mindful of my mom and, and, and bringing germs in. But the second I realized that that had gotten to a point where she was washing her hands raw, immediately we got her into talk therapy. Mm -hmm. And it made the world of difference, a world of difference. And I allowed her, she ended up getting a natural break just recently this last spring. So she was with this person for well over a year and her therapist ended up going on maternity leave and she had been doing really well. So she asked, does she need to see someone else? I was like, no, we can take a break. And my daughter even came up to me just yesterday and said, do I need to meet with so-and-so again? And and I said, well, how do you feel about it? And she goes, 
I don't have any worries right now, so I'm feeling really great about it. And I was like, well, that makes me really happy to hear. I was like, but if you do have worries, what should we do? She goes, well, I'll let you know so if I, so I can start talking to so-and-so oh, again. Great. And I was like, that sounds great. So I think if you ever have any concerns, it's really great to reach out. And it doesn't have to be a psychologist. It doesn't have to be a psychiatrist. I think this was like a licensed professional counselor or there's licensed social workers. I think people hear social worker and they think, oh, that's, you know, dealing with other, but those are who a lot of therapists are. Mm -hmm. They have private practices. And I really do recommend that if you feel like your child is showing any kind of over the top ongoing worries, more than just like I had a stressful day type of worry, like it seems to be ongoing or, you know, that OCD type, to really make sure that you reach out these are professionals who are trained with that, who can really intervene, even with the knowledge that I have. You know, it's one thing I think when your mom, it's like the same concept of when your mom tells you versus like yes. a coach or somebody, our teacher or somebody else tells you kind of thing. And to me, it made a huge, I mean, I almost saw a night and day difference for my daughter, for my daughter at least, within the, the first couple times of her meeting with this person, it really started to help her work through some of those anxieties that she was dealing with. And, and, and those issues that we went to her for initially are no longer there. So I, I recommend parents reaching out to professionals as soon as you feel like something's up. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. The sooner you can, you can intervene, the more likely you are to have a positive outcome. This is a little bit of a change of, you know, direction, but maternal and postpartum health seems mm -hmm. to be something that's still under talked about and hard to identify because you, I remember, you know, being six weeks postpartum and you just hand get handed a piece of paper and you either say yes or no. Mm -hmm. Um, and it's so much more complex than that, obviously. Do you have any thoughts on ways we could better support moms kind of going through this huge transition that regardless of how it hits you mentally is a mental transition. So there's going to be something going on there. My, my biggest thing is talking about it because I feel I have a, I have a 10 year old and I have a nine year old mm -hmm. and I can still vividly remember after I had both of them, I remember sitting on a couch and a McDonald's commercial came on and it was this commercial where this like little boy went up to the counter and like put his change on there and he was like, thank you. And I am just bawling, crying, <laughs> just bawling, crying. And my husband is like, what is wrong with you? And I'm like, he's like, thank you. And it was just so nice. And I'm like losing my mind over this. And I just remember feeling like something is wrong. Like I just had this baby. I love this baby, but like something is not right with me. And I almost feel like there's a level of anxiety that sticks with you that like never goes away as a parent because now yes. you are in charge of this life force yeah. that, and you love them more than anything in the world, but like you also are in charge of their well being and making sure nothing happens to them. Yes. And then as they get older and then they go to like camps or they go to school and it's like, it's out of my, and it's like an yes. anxiety that builds yes. up. And I think the biggest thing is that nobody talks about it. I didn't know that all my friends were experiencing the same thing. And so whenever I have friends who have just had a baby, the first thing I go, but how are you doing? Mm. How are you feeling? Mm -hmm. What are you feeling? What's going on with you? Because that's the first thing I want to hear from them is because everybody comes over and wants to hold the baby and everybody wants to see the baby and everybody wants to fuss over the baby. Rightfully so. I'm the first one to line up for baby snuggles when I have a friend <laughs> who has a baby. But I also know how the mom is feeling because I felt like that. And you feel so alone because yeah. I feel like it's picked up some traction and some people are talking about it more than they used to maybe a decade ago when I had my first child. But, but I still feel like it's not something that's talked about enough. Mm -hmm. And, and it's just this level of anxiety and that just, it's strong. I mean, strong enough to make you cry at McDonald's commercials. <laughs> so, and, and, and it gets, it gets so much better. And I think by the time I had my second child, I was able to go, okay, I know what this feeling is now. I know that it's mm -hmm. going to get better. I know that it's going to subside, that this is like a temporary thing while my hormones are out of control and are trying to get back. But you still have this level of anxiety, especially if you're prone to anxiety that still stays because you're a parent and yeah. you have to be in charge and you have to know where, what are they touching? What are they getting into? What is happening now? This is happening in the world and this is terrifying. Right. And so 
So that's always there. And I think if we just talked about it more. Yeah. And, and you know, we didn't, it wasn't a stigma and people go, okay, this is normal. Everybody's talking about it. Like, I, this is not a weird thing. All right. Like, I, I, I am aware people are checking in on me. They're making sure I'm okay. They're, ta- okay, this is, they've told me it's going to get better. It's going to subside. I think that would help so much to just make a level of awareness that just, I think gets over easily overlooked because people are more focused on the baby and yeah. how exciting it is for the baby to be here. And and I think it would be so great to normalize that, like you're saying, because I think as new parents, we live with this feeling of like, am I normal? Is this normal? And yep. that's all in like exaggerated air quotes. But it's really hard because you want it. You were told you should enjoy this time and what a magical time and All of that can be true. And as you said, you are responsible for something. In my case, I was like, I have not felt love like this before. I Mm -hmm. like this is everything sort of feels like life and death. And you go, is that the appropriate amount of anxiety? Is that just new parenthood? And so I think, like you said, just normalizing that and being able to have those conversations is so huge. That's really, really fantastic. Absolutely. So if anything to your listeners out there, you're not alone. Yes, All of us mamas yes. have been through it. We felt it. It will get so much better. Give yes. it time. Hang in there. Talk to a friend. Yes. Because you'll get through it. Yes. Yes. And I think really remembering, like, not remembering, finding, and sometimes it's hard because maybe you're in a new location or, you know, mm-hmm. there could be other changes going on too, but finding and really leaning on a community as much as possible, whether it be Absolutely. friends or someone who can help or a therapist or, you know, whatever resources you need. That is something that I feel like has been said over and over again. And I'm only starting to really ingest and understand just how essential that support is. Absolutely. Is there anything that we haven't talked about that you want to mention before we wrap up? If anything, I I love interacting with people. I love talking about mental health. If it's school mental health, if it's just being a, uh, as a mom, if it's just like, how do I deal with my kids? I love helping families. So I, I usually go on all my social media handles as at the dot neurodiverse dot teacher. That's on Instagram. That's on TikTok. So if people want to come interact with me, ask me questions. I love, I, as you can't, if you can't tell, I love talking. So <laughs> ask me any questions. If there's any way I can help, I'm definitely a helper. And I recognize that there's a lot of hurt, a lot of frustration, especially in this post-pandemic world. If there's any way I can support, I, I'm happy to do that. Well, it has been so great talking to you. I feel like I could talk to you for hours. So this has been just like so delightful. Same here. My gosh, I feel like I learned so much and I just really appreciate your time. Well, no, thank you for allowing me to come on and and have this conversation with you. I truly appreciate it. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening to this week's episode of Week by Week. Please subscribe, rate, and review wherever you get your podcast. Follow us on Instagram at Week by Week Podcast and visit our blog at weekbyweekpodcast.com. Check out the show notes for more information about our guests and additional resources I used in reference during this episode. This podcast was produced during the COVID-19 pandemic and recorded remotely. Our show today was produced by me, Celeste Busa, Dave Hill, and Douglas Sirine, and produced and edited by Colleen Beasley. Week by Week is a Gumption Pictures production.